Uh, as I talk with donors and partners, uh, I've just found that they are making their decisions much earlier than ever. So I really uh, have been on a one person crusade to get the year end process started in October so that you can hit the ground running in November. And so I'm, that's, that's been my burden. And so uh, Crystal, thanks for giving me this opportunity to be able to present these to individuals so they can get started earlier as well. All right, well, we, uh, we have um, a handful of folks here. So, and we're just at two minutes past the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead uh, and jump on in. Uh, a formal introduction to Jim. Uh, Jim is a wonderful friend of ours here at FundEZ. Uh, he officially works for Crew. Uh, I often refer to him as a development expert because he is uh, just a wealth of knowledge uh, in the world of fundraising and development for how many years, Jim? Well, it's been 38 years now. 38. Wow. I was going to say 35, and I thought that was an old stat. Quite old. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> So um, Jim approached me last month and said, hey, I've been having so many folks question, you know, year-end fundraising and come to me with ideas, and I'd really love to present this. And so uh, absolutely happy to open the door and have Jim just come and share some great information here. I'm hoping today is, um, is really beneficial for all of you and for your nonprofits and uh, that we share some things that are just a uh, pat on the back. Yay, we're already doing this. Uh, as well as some other things that are uh, light bulb moments for you all. So, um, so uh, just a little roadmap for you all. We're going to kind of be going through here. Uh, we laid these out in our promotional materials. So let's jump into who to target. Okay. Now I talked about segmenting, the importance of segmenting. And once again, if because of time or because of your human resources, your process, you aren't able to segment your mailing list. But I'm hoping by starting as early as October, you can begin thinking about are there ways for us to begin to segment our mailing list? Now, once again, if the only thing that you could do was target your critical few, those are that is the 20% that brings in 80% of your dollars. If all you can do is target those people with personalized letter, you would be surprised how well you would do. For a lot of your organizations, that's going to be as few as maybe 25, 35, 40, even 50 people, or maybe less. And so you're talking about a pretty simple letter to do, a personalized Dear John and Mary, and a two-page letter that you would send to them, to the critical few. When we talk about the critical few for most organizations, that 20% is going to be individuals who give largest single gifts of $5,000 or more. The next area is what we refer to as the mid-level. Those are individuals who've given largest single gifts between $1,000 and $499. And so those individuals are just below your critical few, but they're still important. Those individuals in an ideal situation should still get a two-page letter, just like the critical few, personalized, and they should uh, make, you should make sure on both the critical few and the mid-level that the giving opportunities are offered very similar to the, what their gift is. If someone's gift has been 5,000, you'll offer an opportunity of 2,500, 5,000 or $10,000. If their gift is 1,000, you might offer 1,000, 2,500, 5,000, or you might offer 750, 1,000, 2,500, but gear your giving opportunities on your on your last page and on your response card to in, be be equal or similar to what they're past giving hmm. good the last area is the masses this is your dear friend letter this would go out to everyone now although it may seem like this may be the easiest one to do it may not necessarily be the most effective 
once again, just as we talked about the response rates being better with mail, uh, or I'm sorry, with phone call to mail and appointment to phone call, the same is in here. You actually are going to probably get larger gifts and a higher response rate from your critical few, which is expected, those are your larger donors, than you would from your mid-level and your masses. So in reality, if you're trying to choose, do we have enough time and do we have the human resources to be able to get something out the door? Frankly, you're probably going to see a greater return and, of course, more dollars from a letter specifically targeted towards your critical few. But once again, if you can get out something out to everyone, you're going to see a great result in doing so. All right, jumping into how to ask. All right, our various approaches that I mentioned. Uh, with your masses, this is once again a dear friend letter to people. Generally, it's going to be one page front and back. Now, uh, sometimes those are a little bit more difficult to produce. Uh, if you have a high quality uh, printer, you could take it to Kinko's or uh, to uh, FedEx copy nowadays and get those produced that way. But typically, the giving opportunities on that are going to be 100, 250, and 500 on the letter, and then also on the response device. I would make sure that you include a response device in every one of your pieces. People tend to want to respond to that, and you would ask them something as simple as, would you prayerfully consider a gift of 100, 250, or 500, and include your gift with the response card in the envelope provided? So give them clear-cut to search descriptions of that. The next is our mid-level area. Now, our mid-level is where we ramp up our level of personalization. This is a two-page letter. Oftentimes, I'm going to change the stationary size, whereas your masses letter might be eight and a half by 11. To add another level of personalization, I might take it down a notch and use an executive size stationary to make it more personal, to make the touch better. Uh, whereas you might have it on uh, you, the masses letter, you might have it on your organization's letterhead. This might come from the director, from the exec desk of the executive director. Make it as personalized as possible. Dear John and Mary, and once again, in the letter, you're highlighting a higher level of giving. With the mid-level, once again, I recommend something like 1000 uh, $2,500, $5,000, and then I am going to follow up with a phone call. That phone call should really be a fairly easy phone call for you. They've hopefully already received the letter, and your first question was, John and Mary, or John or Mary, did you get the letter that was sent by our executive director, or did you get the letter that, our, that I sent you uh, a few days ago? Generally, the call will come anywhere between 48 and 72 hours after mailing your letter, depending on how far. I'm assuming many of you have local ministries, uh, and so your uh, letters aren't going to have to go too far. If you're sending something from Washington, D.C. to California, give it a little bit more time before you follow up with the phone call. But even if they haven't received the letter or opened the letter, you can say, that's all right. Uh, let me just take a few minutes and explain what the contents was. And I would love to see how much you would be able to give. Not can you give, but how much would you be able to give? We want to take the natural assumption that people enjoy hearing from us. They enjoy the opportunity we present for them and they want to give. So I, my question generally is, uh, have you made a decision on how much you'd like to give? Our next area, last area, of course, is that critical few. Once again, maybe using specialized stationery. If all you can do is use the specialized stationery for the critical few, I would do that and maybe not include that for the mid-level. But if you can do that for at least one of these, 
it will really give another level of personalization. But once again, if all you can do is an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, that's tremendous. But you're going to once again, provide uh, dear John and Mary, and make sure that you are giving another size giving option in your, in your options of giving for your variety. Uh, generally with 5,000 above, I'm going to say, will you prayerfully consider a gift of 5,000, 10,000, or perhaps even 15,000 to help uh, at this particular time? And then I'm going to either follow up with a phone call, once again, because a phone call is going to make a difference, or I'm going to follow up the phone call with a personalized appointment where you actually can meet with someone. Now, a lot of times this is determined by the relationship and also based on your time. If you have a board who's actively involved in your development efforts and they can get on the phone and call people after letters and are willing to challenge people and have no problem talking about money, then you could probably use them to handle your, your mid-level area and that you, if you're the executive director, development director, you can focus in on that critical few to have appointments with those individuals and, and really take the time to meet with them. We're going to talk in a few minutes about the content of that, uh, that appointment and what we would present when you meet with them. But at this point, uh, we're just talking about trying to get that appointment with them. Good. So um, that's uh, really, I feel like, so clear cut the, the stepping stones from one to the next to the next uh, and adding some additional, um, some additional pieces of points of contact, points of asking. Uh, that's great, Jim. Um, we have a question uh, here that I was hoping you could answer real quick. Uh, Sydney's wondering, should we wait to post on social media with a link to give for year end until after we've spoken with our critical few? I assume we'd present smaller opportunities to give in the post. Well, that's a great question. Absolutely, I would wait. Uh, we're going to talk in just a minute about uh, getting some pace get setting gifts first and also the... Um, the, the critical few. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Because the assumption is going to be, and generally the, uh, the result, is that gifts that come in through social media are going to be smaller. The one thing you would not want to have happen is someone had the capability to give a large gift, and they saw it on social media, gave a $100 gift, when in the past they've given $2,500 or $5,000, or even had, if they received a letter, would, would give a $10,000 gift, last thing you want them to do is to respond on social media. Uh, and so you, uh, you really want to try and give your mail a little time to settle in and to start getting some responses. And I would say that's about 10 days afterwards, typically uh, seven to 10 days afterwards is, is what we see uh, from most cases. Great. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Okay, determine your strongest cause concept. You're going to want to make sure you ask three key questions. And those questions are, what's your greatest need? I talked about that earlier. What would most excite your donor and their partner? And what would uh, be embraced by the broadest audience? So it's going to be really important that at this time of the year, you not test out something necessarily new. I would go back to my bread and butter. Now, if you had a project or a program or starting a new strategy or a pregnancy center, and we're going to roll out an abstinence program, and you really want to kick it out off after the first of the year, uh, I think it's fine to go ahead and do that. But I would go back to your bread and butter, those things that most excite people and have been the best winners for you in the past. Uh, going back and using those cause concepts to be your appeal at your end. And that's typically when I say a cause concept, that's a project or a program that needs specific funding. And again, if you can give people very specific quantitative results, 
uh, for a gift of this, we can see this happen. That's always going to be better. And I include those in my letter because that is, uh, that's what's going to motivate people when they, when they can see how they can have a tangible result from their specific gift. It's going to make a big difference for you. So make sure when you're developing your cause concept, you ask those things. Great. Okay, we're going to talk about that area that I love the most, which I call a game changer, and that's your matching gift approach. Uh, Crystal, would you mind listing all three of those at one time for sure. us? Um, I really, uh, as I after I put all my notes together, I started really thinking. Uh, I really think it's most important to start with your overall goal, because as I'm approaching my matching gift, uh, I would really like to find pace setting gifts that are going to be an important component of the total goal. So if you've set out for your year end that you want to try and raise $50,000 at year end, I'd like to try and get at least $25,000 in matching gifts so that I can get 50% and that the partners in the letter can give the remaining 50%. So I use that goal as a way to set the pace setting gifts. Now, if 50% isn't ideal, but frankly, as I mentioned with that dinner, uh, they had a $90,000 goal and they had a $10,000 match. Um, that wasn't even 10% of their overall goal. Uh, don't let that deter you from getting a match. If all you can do is get $10,000, if all you can do is get $15,000 towards your total goal, it's worth doing. And I believe you should do it. What I usually do is in soliciting my pace setting gifts, I will take my overall goal. For our example here, if we have an overall goal of 50,000, hoping to raise 25,000, I'm gonna look for five individuals who are willing to give $5,000 to be my pace setters. Those individuals will make commitments. We're going to talk in just a minute about some ECFA regulations, but I'm going to use the term commitments because the gift has to come later to be able to be used as a match. And so those individuals will be asked to be part of an overall goal. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we've set a goal of 25000 for our year end. We're trying to find five individuals who give $5,000 to meet that. I know in the past you've given 5,000. Would you be willing to give that again? Or would you even be willing to give a little bit more? A gift of 7,500 would help us to get to our goal even faster. We would appreciate that. Now, if you're saying, wow, I don't have anyone who gives 5,000 or few who give 5,000, then slice and dice your 25,000 a different way. Can you find some people to give five and some to give 2,500? Maybe you need 10 people to give 2,500 to get to your goal or half of five and half of 2,500, but somehow use that number to get to your goal. And then of course, challenge your pace setters. Let the individuals know that their giving will be used in a letter to be used for the masses. Their giving will motivate others to give, will accelerate the giving of others and provide leverage giving. What I mean by leverage giving is that their gift will not only make a difference by being used in your ministry for your mission, but it'll be used to leverage other people to give money. And you'd be surprised how often that motivates and encourages people when they know that their money is going to be used to leverage others to give. And so it's great to do that. Uh, in this letter, I, I am always a big fan of using a minimum amount. I love to use the amount of $1,200 or $100 a month. And of course, this motivates people to give a monthly, again, which we all love. But also remember that even if all you did was put it out and made the match for everyone, 
that would be fine. But know that it really is that critical few. Uh, it's a match to get someone to give $10 so that their money will be doubled to 20 is great. But if I can give someone to give $5,000 and that money will be matched to 10 because they want to help us reach a specific goal of 10,000, that's going to make a much bigger difference. So that matching gift program is going to be very important for you. Uh, going back to the ECFA comment, the ECFA really wants us to make sure that we do not get a gift from those pay setters until the campaign is ended. So we know exactly how much of their gift will be used. I can't remember the last time I didn't have all of our pay setting money given or met on the second, on the second end of things, but sometimes that can happen. Uh, just an important point to remember, don't tell them to hold their gift beyond December 31st, uh, even if you believe you're going to get money after January, because a lot of them still benefit from that tax gift. So you may be asking someone for a gift in, uh, in the first week of November, but you're asking them to hold that if they can until mid-December, till the campaign has begun to uh, start to wane out. Great, Jim. I uh, was sharing with Jim yesterday, our local pregnancy center uh, received a matching gift uh, specifically for uh, recurring giving. So uh, monthly donors, they wanted to see those increase. And so their match was for um, any gifts given during a certain time period uh, that were either new monthly commitments or increased monthly commitments. And my husband and I had been talking for a couple months about increasing our monthly commitment and just hadn't pulled the trigger on it. Uh, and so receiving that letter in the mail saying, hey, if you increase your gift, it's going to be matched for the next year. Um, that really motivated us to, uh, to finally do that. And we know that the match goes through their gala, which is this week. Uh, and so we've already been talking about the gift we're going to give at the gala and thought, you know what? we could actually increase that a little more than we did last month. So uh, our plan is again, to increase that in order to get that match and help the ministry even more. So um, I'm just seeing this from the perspective of a donor who's currently in the middle of, you know, considering these gifts and that match was absolutely the motivator for us to increase our giving. I love it. I, you know, there are still people that think matches are hokey or matches don't work, but I'll tell you a great majority do. So mm -hmm. now you'll want to include this matching opportunity in your letter. Uh, make sure that you establish a minimum, as we talked about, and then uh, get, uh, get, get the appointment with people. And if you're going to go and meet with someone, make sure you bring up this matching gift opportunity, because especially if there's critical few people who weren't part of your pay setters, uh, get an appointment with those, those individuals and uh, make sure you challenge them. Uh, we're going to jump into the appointment. What to bring during your appointment. Now, we talked about, remember, this is generally a higher level of relationship and a higher level of partner as well. Their ability to give is going to be greater. So the biggest thing is to set up an appointment. Um, you don't want to set up an appointment, call someone and say, do you have an hour and a half of your time? Generally, you should be able to get your appointment done in 30 to 45 minutes. Um, if someone, if you are in the middle of your talk and someone says, uh, you know, you, you can stay a little bit longer, fine, but generally keep your time to 30 to 45 minutes. What to bring on the appointment? Make sure you bring as much as, as possible knowing that a lot of what you're going to be doing is simply giving someone something to look at later. Uh, it's going to be used more as backup information for you. Think of about an appendix in the back of a book, but any brochures, any newsletters, if you create an annual report, you may want to bring that with you. Uh, if you have a video, I probably wouldn't go in in a year-end meeting with people, just knowing how busy people are your end and lead with uh, let's watch our 10 minute or five minute video. 
but I might leave that with them or tell them you're going to send a link or send a link ahead on something. And then the biggest thing to remember is to bring with you a personalized prospectus. Now, what that is, is they already through the letter have gotten a pretty good idea, or at least should have, of what your project or program is for your end. This prospectus, this is not a 25-page document. This is a two-page uh, document, one page on one and uh, another on the second page. You're going to be outlining the need that exists, the problem that exists that needs to be solved. If it's a pregnancy center, you can list the um, individuals who, uh, you know, how many individuals are uh, considering abortion in your community and the number of abortions in your community, and then move on to the solution, which would be your pregnancy center and the services that you provide, counseling, one-on-one uh, -on -one training, uh, um, ultrasounds, whatever you're doing within that. And then how can their giving make a difference? So you're going to get to what is the need or the opportunity that exists and focus in on an opportunity. Uh, make sure, I, I don't think I need to say it, but I will, uh, that helping us finish the year in the black is not what would be considered a good project. Uh, starting an abstinence program or helping to uh, kick off a training program or some endeavor that you're going to be doing. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we present this prospectus to people. This is just a simple presentation uh, on, on what we're doing. Great. I think Jim, um, we're gonna explore the appointment a little bit more. Um, in kind of the opening, what you know, what it actually looks like, and just kind of like uh, the the story of this appointment. Yeah, so you just, you really want to start out first of all doing more listening than talking. We are so tempted to just jump in and start talking right away, uh, but I would listen to find out. Uh, you know, how did you find out about X Y Z Pregnancy Center? How did you hear about what we're doing? And uh, you know, what is it that makes them weep and pound the table? and uh, listen, and then talk about your statement of purpose. We're gonna also wanna make sure you're using open-ended and probing questions with people. Uh, you know, when is the, uh, what, what is it about what we do that excites you most? Listen carefully to their response because you'll wanna use that during your presentation. Right. You wanna share information about your organization once again, as I mentioned, talk about what are your programs, what are your strategies, what do you do? Relate what your organization is doing about concerns and interests that they mentioned earlier, and then check for understanding all the way through. Make sure that they understand. Then, of Good. course, <laughs> I was going to say check for understanding doesn't mean, does that make sense? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. It's more asking, like, can you... Do you understand that? Like, you know, does uh, repeat it back to me in some way? So, um, yeah, I was just kind of chuckling at that. Right. Absolutely. Then, of course, the important element is that request for funds. State a significant reason for them to give. Ask for a specific amount. Mr. and Mrs. Jo uh, Jones or Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones, would you prayerfully consider a gift of $25,000 to help us kick off our abstinence program? And ask for, of course, the program that you described. Keep your request simple and straightforward. Don't get complex. Now, there's eight ways to slice and dice the, your giving opportunity or eight ways that could be used. You don't want to do that. And make sure once you challenge them and ask them, make sure you let them finish off with an answer. Don't speak before them. We always have the tendency to backpedal. Oh, uh, boy, did I ask for too much? I'm sorry, Mr. Jones. Uh, I, I didn't mean 25,000. I meant five. I meant actually, I'm sorry to bother you today. Uh, don't get into that. Uh, just let them uh, pray about it, think about it, and respond. 
That's good. There is power in an awkward silence as much as I hate them. (laughs) And make sure that you always respond back. If they say, will you please um, let my wife and I pray about this? Would you get back to me? Always keep it in your court, not in theirs. Not, well, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, just get back to me whenever. No, if you met them on Wednesday, can I call you back on Friday or can I call you back on Monday morning after you've had a chance to do this? Uh, Make sure you contact them and uh, make sure, especially when it's a maybe. Great. All right. right. And then uh, bringing it home, how to appreciate. Yep. Well, I can't say it enough. I said it earlier. It's so important. The statistics are heartbreaking of how many organizations, nonprofits, and ministries never thank their partner after a gift. And I would thank them whether they give you a gift or not. Thank you for taking the time. Because in many cases, that no response is no, not now. Uh, I'm just not in a position to give now. So sending a thank you, thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy person. Uh, It meant a lot for me to be able to come to you. That's so important for all gifts. Send a thank you, depending on the size. You may want to call and thank people or even have a second visit. But in all cases, uh, I'd send a thank you. That's great. Um, Jim, one thing we didn't mention here uh, in how to appreciate, but uh, it's so important and you brought it up earlier, is sending a donation receipt in a really timely manner. I, is the statistic still true that that should go out within two weeks of the gift? Well, at, yes, at the at the at the latest, it really should. Um, you know, I, in a in a perfect world, uh, 24, 48 hours. But the one thing that uh, you don't want to get into that trap is, uh, hey, our part time accountant comes in once a month, and uh, I know you gave a gift on the third of October, but we're sending it out on the thirty first of October. Try and avoid that. Yeah, yeah. At a minimum, at a very minimum, it should be every two weeks. But if you can do it sooner, please do it. Good. And then uh, the last question I think we have time for, but of course, uh, please note Jim's email uh, down there on the screen. Uh, Also, uh, his YouTube channel. He's got all kinds of incredible videos on there. Uh, Pretty short. He posts a weekly video um, that uh, is just really Two weekly videos, my bad. Two, two week, yep. <laughs> um, that uh, are just fantastic in regards to all things development. Uh, he also has a Jim and Java section where he's uh, answering questions. So uh, just a wonderful resource for you all. If you're not subscribed to his YouTube channel, go ahead and uh, scan that QR code and subscribe. I'll include a link in the follow-up email as well. And I've created a uh, year-end playlist for 2022 for year-end strategies and plans, and I'll be populating that. So uh, be sure to subscribe to the channel and uh, you'll make sure you'll be able to take advantage of the playlist that will be going out. Good deal. So last question, Jim, Uh, are you saying that pace setters are the ones matching everyone else's gift or are you finding an organization that matches gifts? No, uh, pace setters um, is that, that, that's the people who are matching everyone else's gift. Um, could you use organizations? Yes, you could do that. Generally, the pace setter is going to be an individual, uh, but you may have, uh, of course, there may be an individual who gives from their corporation, or there may be some corporations who have given to other things. And you may, it may be a great opportunity for you to, to branch out. Somebody is a, is a corporate sponsor of your walk every year. But at year end, you want to go to them and say, um, you know, would you also be willing to be one of our pace setters to help match uh, year end as well, too? That would be lumped together. Generally, you're not releasing or revealing any of the names of your pace setting people. uh, So it wouldn't be something where you would be highlighting somewhere. um, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A is one of our pace setters for our year end. That wouldn't be something that you'd want to do or or um, or would be 
would be encouraged. And so that may change whether someone, a, a corporate or an organization would want to be a pay setter or not, uh, because that you wouldn't be promoting them for that. But it's generally individuals. Great. Jim, I just so appreciate your time. As always, you're a wealth of knowledge, uh, and it's always a pleasure connecting with you. Uh, I do pray that this was super valuable to everyone. Um, I will send out a post uh, webinar survey and I would love your feedback. I review that. Uh, it helps us to plan for the future. It helps us to know if we're hitting the mark. So please be sure to uh, do submit your feedback in that survey. And um, wonderful. Well, I got some feedback that said it was so helpful. I'm so glad. So, uh, Jim, uh, we just appreciate you so much. And I do pray blessings on uh, everyone that's here, everyone that's listening to the recording in the future, uh, that your ministries would be blessed with a really abundant year end so that you can continue to do good uh, and change lives in the years to come.